Hey guys, and welcome to Sacred Shadows and Might and Light. I am so excited because tomorrow is April Fool's Day. And so we are going to do a three-part series on Shakespeare's Fool. So I'm going to do this in three parts. For the first part, I'm going to focus on the comedies. Then I'm actually going to skip the histories, go to the tragedies, and then I'll come back to the histories. Many people already know that in Shakespeare's plays, the fool is often the smartest person in the play, definitely in the comedies. But something amazing that Shakespeare did was he expanded the fool and foolishness in general as a way of not only maintaining and restoring truth, but as a way of surviving an upending of values, a time when values are being questioned. Okay? And I'll get into the, that as we go. So for this first part, we're going to look at the fool as the source of wisdom in Shakespeare's comedies. We're going to talk about As You Like It and Twelfth Night. Now, of course, As You Like It, we have the fool touchstone. Right away, we should see the name that Shakespeare gives him is intentional. A touchstone back then was a, a rock that you would use to test what type of metal something is, whether it was truly gold or whether it was false. And that already gives us a clue to how Shakespeare saw the role of the fool in society and in politics. It's a way of testing the pretensions of the other characters in the play. Of course, we have Touchstone. We get to meet him in Act 1, Scene 2. Right away, Celia and Rosalind both identify wisdom and intelligence with him. He gives a syllogism, which is an Aristotelian formula of logic, which we'll talk about that. And Celia says, how prove you that in the great heap of your knowledge? And Rosalind says, I, Mary, now unmuzzle your wisdom. Of course, you might not expect the... F the fool, I mean, just by the name fool, it means someone who's not smart, all right? But Shakespeare flipped that on top of itself. Okay? He makes him the smartest person in the play, okay, as the source of all truth and wisdom, which that fits with the comic genre. The idea that in comedy plays, it starts all messy and then it ends put together. The fool is the one that, that is pretty much the same throughout. Anyway, further down in that scene, he gives yet another syllogism, kind of proving you guys don't have, you ladies don't have beards, which again, prescience of the fool in As You Like It, because Celia and Rosalind are gonna have to go pretend to be boys. He says, you don't have beards, I'm not a fool. Then he starts talking about Celia's father who ousted Rosalind's father from the throne. Okay, and Celia says, my father's love is enough to honor him. Enough, speak no more of him. You'll be whipped for taxation one of these days. And Touchstone says, the more pity that fools may not speak wisely, what wise men do foolishly. Celia says, by my troth thou sayest true. For since the little wit that fools have was silenced, the little foolery that wise men have makes a great show. So right away we get the fool connected with wisdom, with knowledge, with wit, as well as with the ability to get rid of the pretensions of those in power, okay? The role of the fool in Elizabethan times and before him was, their job was to be able to show reality to those who are in power, okay? The idea of being the mirror that I'm allowed to say whatever I want so that you know what's really going on because everyone else is scared of you. Everyone else is going to be a flatterer of, of yours. If you don't have at least someone saying, ah, 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 you're not as smart as you think you are. You're not as big as you think you are. Okay? He kind of breaks the pretensions of those in power. And it's also a way of showing other people what the king's really thinking, what the, the person in charge is really thinking, because the king has to, has to maintain his, uh, his decorum. But the fool, he's allowed to do anything. He's allowed to say anything. A lot of times we get to see fools kind of saying what the king uh, presumably wishes he could say. Now, without the fool, of course, the ruler has no way to see what they're doing and see how they're doing, okay? It's just, they're essentially paying someone to insult them and criticize them ironically. The fool is the opposite of sycophants and flatterers. Without the fool, the pretense of the would-be great goes untested because they can't see what's truly great or what is just pretending to be so, especially himself. That's one of the paradoxes of Shakespeare's Fool, is that by sh distorting accepted reality through humor, because humor is a distortion of reality, it's something you wouldn't expect, uh, it's an irony, okay? The Fool actually shows reality. The Fool shows us what's really going on by distorting it, okay? And in, in that sense, the Fool serves as kind of a, a safety valve against accumulating too much pretense or power. Which, in the comedies, that's not really that big of a deal. But later on in the tragedies and the history plays, it becomes a matter of life and death. And something else that 
that Shakespeare does right from the get-go is he links the fool, Touchstone, with the syllogism. It's an Aristotelian formula of logic of proving something. The classic one is man is mortal, Socrates is a man, Socrates is mortal. Okay, it's a way of using a minor, major and minor premises to prove something. Now, at the time that Shakespeare was writing, in the 1500s, now Shakespeare was writing in the late 1500s, earlier in the 1500s, Luther started the Reformation. The, there was a lot of questions about, it. no, that's a nice way of saying it, it was illegal to be a Catholic when Shakespeare was growing up. All right, it, it could lead to arrest and death. In Catholic history, there was a tradition called scholasticism. If you look up uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, he was a big guy in that because he used Aristotle's logic to deal with a lot of the questions and problems in the church. And so having a fool link back to that tradition, the Catholic tradition of the syllogism and church logic would have been a clue. It would have been a kind of dog whistle to the to possible recusants. I mean, I don't, there's a lot of debate about whether Shakespeare was a Catholic, whether his family was Catholic, but he was just a young kid growing up in a changing world. Okay, but all of that, it showed him the dramatic value of having a fool be the source of logic for a play. Again, what we wouldn't expect. He continues that linking of wit, of logic, and of knowledge with the fool in Twelfth Night's Festa. In his first scene of Twelfth Night, Festa, right from the beginning, he says, well, God give them wisdom that have it, and those that are fools, let them use their talents. Okay, so again, he's kind of playing with this idea of wisdom and foolery. And Olivia, Olivia eventually enters, and he, he actually prays, wit, and it be thy will, put me into good fooling. Okay, because he, he has to do a job. He's been absent for a while, and he's a paid fool, so he has to do his job. Those wits that think they have, they do very oft prove fools. People who think they're wise often get proven to be fools. And I, that I'm sure I lack thee, may pass for a wise man. For what says Quinopolis, better a witty fool than a foolish wit. Now, who do we know that ended up being wise because he assumed and believed and understood that he was not wise. Yes, Socrates, the first real wise man, not the first real wise man, but but again, there's a, the tradition of only those who are able to, um, to question not only the values of their culture, but also their own perceptions. Uh, that, that That's actually a start of wisdom, the idea that there are greater things than my perspective. That actually is something that Shakespeare links with wisdom and with foolery, that you actually have to have some of that like self-criticism, the ability to not take yourself so seriously. That's part of wisdom. We continue with the scene. He gives yet another syllogism to this mourning Olivia, who her brother has just died. And so, yeah, he really does need to cheer her up. He proves that actually she is the fool because she's mourning her brother whose soul is in heaven. And then she asks Malvolio, the Puritan, the fool's opposite. Uh, he's, he's just this pretentious uh, Puritan guy who wants to have no fun. Uh, in the words of Sir Toby Belch, dost thou think that because thou art virtuous there shall be no cakes and ale? It's one of the few times where Shakespeare presents a perspective without really presenting it sympathetically, all right? And no wonder, because Puritans at the time were you know, were shutting down his theaters. I mean, even the word Puritan was a slur. It wasn't. We're not talking about the Puritans who uh, later came across on the Mayflower. These are kind of a joke on these like hard Protestants who wanted you have to do everything by the by the rules and, and according to scripture and all this. And they're like, you know what? Whatever. We have a rich culture already. Okay. Um, why are you getting rid of all of the art? All right, but you know, I'm getting off topic. Um, not really, but uh, anyway. So Olivia asks Malvolio, "What do you think? Okay, what thinks thou? What think you of this fool, Malvolio? Doth he not mend? Is, doesn't he make one feel better? Uh, yes, and shall do till the pangs of death take him. Infirmity that decays the wise doth ever make the better fool. He's kind of saying, well, he's only funny because he's an idiot. God send you, sir, a speedy infirmity, says Veste, for the better increasing your folly. Like, okay, well, if you have to become an idiot, if you have to become infirm to become a fool, then I hope you get some, f some infirmity so you can become more of a fool. Again, we have this altering and flipping over of values. Of course, Malvolio gets offended. He sees he doesn't see uh, Feste as, as humorous. He's just prickly because he's making fun of him. He actually compares him to Andrew Aguecheeks. He, he sees no difference uh, between intentional, witty foolery uh, and actual idiocy of uh, Sir Andrew Aguecheeks. He just assumes that anyone who laughs at the fool are the fool's zanies, he says. They're just being paid by him. Okay, so he has no conception of, 
like the value foolery and that makes him the perfect butt of all the fool's jokes because he has zero self-criticism and zero room to be ironic about himself so he doesn't see all the pretensions that he has that is bait for for the fool in fact olivia says like you are sick of self-love malvolio and taste with a distempered appetite yeah you can't even you, you don't even understand what's funny okay because you are so sick of self-love uh, and then later on in the play viola she says this, this great line this man is wise enough to play the fool so we get this this amazing in these two plays and uh, other places in the comedies shakespeare develops this idea of the fool as the source of truth and wisdom and clear thought. You can't get more clear thoughted than a, than a syllogism. I mean, it's, it's like the opposite of subjectivity. But that's, again, even that is part of the fun, part of the irony in it, because you wouldn't, you'd expect that to be in a scholar or in a monk or in a priest or something. You wouldn't expect it to be in a jester, all right? And so in, in these plays, Shakespeare develops the link between the allowed fool the Catholic syllogism and intentional offense of the upper class, or at least those who, who pretend to power, uh, as well as a source of entertainment and honesty. Okay, now the whole fool dynamic, and this is something that we'll, we'll talk about in these three videos, the whole fool dynamic relies on irony and misdirection. If you're not looking, if, he, if you just dismiss him, you're not going to see the wisdom that he has. In order for it to be funny, the audience has to actually believe the illusion that he's a fool when really he's the smartest person in the play okay now and that plays into that says something about like the obscurity of wisdom okay the idea that only those who are willing to dig or or remain past being offended or uh, able to endure difficulty of criticism either of criticism or just of difficult times are able to find wisdom everything you think is valuable should be flipped upside down if it means getting wisdom. And that's something that Shakespeare really shows in these characters. And it's actually a key aspect of my book, Sacred Shadows and Light and Light. Even the title, which is from Les Miserables, it's a, the idea that light is not light as we think about it, it's in the shadows. The light is where, light or truth or whatever you need to learn to survive, or, or true virtue or values, it's where you're not looking, okay? It's outside of your knowledge. It's outside of what you're comfortable with. Even the things you're comfortable with, you might not understand, and that's something that we're going to get into in the in the tragedies, where the thing that you think you understand, actually it has depths to it, it has light and shadows in it that you don't know. So you always have to be questioning the things that you uh, that you understand, right? The, or you think you understand. The idea that um, power, uh, the idea of understanding something, having that sort of power over it, it makes you, it makes you stupid about it. It makes you stop thinking about it. That's why the fool is always always it, it, it's not that the fool has no v values or has, has no virtues in fact it, shakespeare seems to be pointing us to like they value wisdom and truth and logic it's everybody else who is illogical uh, which that's just hilarious that, that irony he's flipping he's um flipping he's doing a role reversal there but it's the idea that a way to understand something better is to play with it okay to pick it apart and uh, that actually there's this line from from Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky, which I think is going to be one of the epigrams uh, to my book. It says that nobody ever got to a single truth without talking nonsense 14 times first, maybe even 114. And that I think is, is part of the virtue of the fool. The idea that nonsense and wisdom are a lot closer to each other than we think. Now that doesn't mean that stupid things aren't stupid, but in a world where, and this is something that we'll talk about in a little while, in a world where the values are all messed up and they're all flipped all over, guess what? If you wanna get wise, you have to be a little bit foolish. Okay? You have to be willing to question your values, to reconsider how you see or interpret something, uh, bad or good or uh, beneficial or detrimental, all of that. That's something that Shakespeare, I think, shows us in his Fools in, in the Comedies. Okay? So, thank you. Look forward to the second part. I'm going to talk about the fool and foolishness in the tragedies. And again, happy April Fool's Day.